They say it's BBC One with Nick Ross and Fiona Bruce and this month's Crime Watch UK. And welcome to Crime Watch live from Television Centre in West London. Your chance to help with the fight against crime. Gathered here in the studio are some 24 detectives, most of them senior investigating officers. They come from uh, 11 forces uh, across Great Britain and indeed Northern Ireland too. And indeed a couple of them come from a private police force about which we'll tell you more later. They've all got crimes they think you can help to solve. Coming up on the programme tonight, the strange and violent burglar who turned on the lights and made a lot of noise. You've heard of cheating on who wants to be a millionaire. Now the scam taking advantage Sorry, of the national lottery. What is it? I've won the lottery. Two million quid. And diamonds are a girl's best friend, so can you help find Marilyn Monroe's jewels? Although burglary rates are actually falling around the country, when one does happen, most burglars are pretty anxious to get in and out as quickly and as quietly as possible, which makes this next case rather unusual and unusual in another sense. It happened in Bourne, a town in Lincolnshire last March, last month rather, and it's the first serious crime there for six years. You're watching BBC Two. I'm really tired, I'm going to bed. Okay. Sat and watched some TV with my wife. Um, my daughter was working on her project for uh, uh, GCSEs in, in the dining room. Uh, I went off to bed about 11 o'clock, leaving them downstairs. You coming to bed now? Yeah. We were sitting watching the television for a bit. She took a break. And it was getting quite late then, and I suggested that maybe it was time to, to go on up to bed and to, to start at the work fresh in the morning. She's great. She just is someone's idea of a model daughter, I think. She's, she's very conscientious. She works really hard at school. But she's got a great sense of humour. She's quite mature. She's got a very strong sense of what's right and what's wrong. The intruder got into the house through uh, the window in the utility room. Um, there's a small fan light window there uh, that uh, we used to vent the tumble dryer through. Wouldn't normally be running the tumble dryer at night, but we were due to go away on holiday, uh, so had left the tumble dryer running overnight. The burglar was astonishingly brazen. As he got into the house, he didn't seem to care how much of a racket he made. Um, I was aware of noise in the kitchen. I could hear the drawers being opened and closed. But I just assumed that my daughter was behind downstairs and maybe she changed her mind and was, was getting herself a snack or a drink and bringing it upstairs with her. So I didn't really think much about it. This was no ordinary burglar. Not only did he take the knife, he then turned on all the downstairs lights. I took the opportunity of calling on Miss Bingley in Grover Street. My visit was not long. The door pushed open slightly and I saw a head kind of pop round the door and um, I was just trying to think who it was. I didn't recognise the person. Be quiet and lie down on your back. I just didn't see how I could get out of the room if he had a knife and how, you know, he was going to leave me if I'd seen his face. He seemed early 20s and he was tall, six foot to six foot three. He had a long face with around a day's worth of stubble, and he was medium build. His hair was sandy coloured, short at the sides, sticking up at the front, and flat at the back. Dad! Dad! There's somebody in the house! There's somebody in the house! Dad! 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 Oh. Oh. The thing I remember most is, is just the terror in my daughter's screams. Come here. He turned in the living room. I didn't realise at that stage that uh, he had a knife. Um, it was only once we were resting on the floor that I realised that he had a knife and that, that I'd been cut. 
In fact, some of the father's blood fell on the intruder, so the burglar might have gone home early in the morning with blood on his collar. Really, I, I, was, I was just thinking of keeping him away from the rest of the family. That, that's all that was in my mind, and, and to try and get him out of the house as quickly as possible. She was actually more frightened for her dad, I think, than she was for herself. Uh, she was obviously concerned that there was, was going to be some sort of fight and that this was a dangerous man. What about Dad? Is Dad OK? <laughs> the fact that this guy took one of our own knives and came upstairs and threatened one of us, um, not just with harm, but also sexually, I'd just leaves us all feeling very vulnerable and very frightened. At this stage, I didn't realise my, my daughter had been hurt as well. So I went to the sink uh, in the kitchen just to try and wash the ton of the blood away and just thought, I can't let the children see me like this. There's was, was a lot of blood around. <laughs> I'm not angry. It's just I can't understand why anybody would want to hurt someone else. Um... I just don't understand it. Well, who can? This is Detective Chief Inspector Glenn Harris of Lincolnshire Police trying to find out who did it. And first of all, how often has, have you encountered anything like this before? I mean, I said this, we haven't had any serious crime at all in Bourne for six years, but I mean, how often does this happen? It's a, a very, very rare occurrence. Uh, as I said, particularly, it's under 1% under is this type of burglary, particularly in a, in a town like Bourne in rural Lincolnshire. So that's, I mean, I think it's under 1% or even called aggravated burglaries, and probably under 1% of yeah, those or anything like as bad as, as that. But at least you've got an EFIT, you've got a pretty good description, both from the dad and, and from the daughter. What can you tell us about him, apart from his, well, his height? He's, he's fairly yeah, he's, distinctive he's, in that he's respect. He's a tall, uh, tall chap, six foot two, six foot three. I um, said so the father's very tall as well, and he says definitely six foot two, six foot three. And he's got, uh, our actor couldn't do it without it sounding a bit comical, because it's very difficult to do. He's got a sort of deep, rasping sort of accent, and you don't think he was putting it on. It's a yeah, that, that's right. But both um, the daughter and the father sort of said it's quite a, a, a distinctive rasping, uh, rasping sound is the, uh, is the phrase that they've used to describe it. But a clean smell. This is no down and out. This is no tramp. And he wasn't at the, at the nightclub or something in Bourne dancing the night, night no, away. No, the nightclub um, is one area that people may well be coming away from that. Uh, this this, this uh, offender had not been to the nightclub. He smelt clean. Um, and if, if anybody saw um, the offender, he, he did throw a knife away, which was nearby, um, into a that river. Was, that was the knife that was taken from the kitchen block? That's correct, it is, yeah. And, and he threw that where? Just he threw that in a, in a river that's uh, nearby, yeah. Now, obviously that might have been seen as somebody coming out of the nightclub, just somebody tossing something away, 7th, 7th of March. He stole a camera very much like this one. Uh, it's a Comedia, um, an Olympus Comedia camera. Now, there are a lot of these around, obviously, the importance of this is if someone can connect it with somebody who looks like that and is over six foot tall. That's that's what we're looking. If anybody's tried to dispose of a camera that that fits the fit and looks similar, then please give us a call. And this business about blood on him. I mean, the, the dad was quite badly bleeding. The daughter was bleeding. So he might have got blood on his shirt. Blood on his shirt. Yeah. If 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 anyone has come home, friend, relative, or any workers, it's quite a sort of temporary workforce in the area of Bourne. So if anybody's come home or at work the next day that that has acting suspicious, strange, or got cuts, minor grazes, or blood on their clothing, then please contact I us. I would have said, of course, they'd been involved in a fight or, or, or something like that. How easy is it going to be for you, if, if you find him, to eliminate false calls? It's, it's not easy on this one, is it? No, it's not, no. But we're, we're, we're quite hopeful that um, we'll be able to identify the individual once we uh, put them on a parade. Well, I mean, it's a good e we've got good descriptions. Call us here in the studio, 0500 600 600, or contact the Instant Room Direct if you want. That's an 01476 403 285. And you can always contact us by email if you're on that, um, uh, or through our website. That's bbc.co.uk forward slash crime. And incidentally, in the last Crime Watch, I told you about the gun amnesty which has been running this month, which allows anybody to hand in illegally held firearms without the risk of prosecution. It ends at midnight tonight. Now, the last count, as you may have seen, some 20,000 weapons had been handed in across Great Britain. Among the more intriguing donations are this World War I anti-tank gun, which was taken into a police station in Fife, 
and this rocket launcher which was handed in in Aberdare in South Wales. Now if you've got one of these or anything like it hiding behind the sofa, you've got what, two and a half hours, a bit more, left to hand it in, no questions asked. If you ever wonder what the chances are of you personally solving a Crime Watch appeal, the answer is maybe better than you think. Just look at the developments since last month. There's been dramatic progress over Hannah Foster, the teenager from Southampton who was found murdered near her home. We decided to go to the Sobar to see if there were any of our other friends down there. After our appeal, one call in particular caused a flurry of excitement. As a direct result, and as you may have read, a warrant has been issued for a man who's now believed to be in India. Obviously, we'll let you know what happens. Other calls led to the identification of three suspects after our footage of rioters at Millwall Football Club. Met Police are still trying to identify some of those involved since the riot took place a year ago. Three of the faces we showed still haven't been named. Do you know who they are? The most remarkable progress from last month was on the notorious case that goes back almost 40 years, the murder of the 13-year-old schoolgirl, Anne Dunwell. The response was absolutely magnificent. We had over 180 phone calls uh, and those 70 individuals named as a result of Crime Watch. Some of those people we'd already looked at and eliminated, but there were a lot of fresh people, so we were really, really pleased with the response we got. Two months ago, we appealed on behalf of Shropshire Social Services for the return of four children who'd been abducted and taken to Spain. Last month, independently of Crime Watch, Spanish authorities arrested a couple. The children have now been returned to the care of social services. But heartbreaking news from Spain following an appeal we made back in October. North Wales police have been searching for Linda and Tony O'Malley who, much to their family's distress, had vanished from near Benidorm. They and their car have disappeared, along with all their savings. Sadly, the couple's bodies were discovered last month, and it seems they were murdered for their money. North Wales police have been working closely with the Spanish police, and four people have been arrested. Two of them have been charged with kidnap and murder, and would appear at court in Benidorm. Of course, we'll keep you updated on any further developments. Now, here from the National Centre for Policing Excellence is Detective Sergeant Jackie Haynes. Two clips of CCTV footage for you to look, take a look at this month. One from inside a jewellers in Bristol and this first one from outside Brannigan's nightclub in Southampton. This is a violent attack last November. The pictures aren't the clearest, but we have so many other good clues that someone watching must recognise this man. The victim is on High Street, talking to his girlfriend, when this man standing next to him smashes a glass in his face. He then runs away, chased by the victim's girlfriend and brother. The victim says he talked to his attacker in a pub earlier that night. My colleagues in Southampton know a lot about him, but just can't find him. They believe his name is James and that he's originally from the North East, and he's a Sunderland football supporter. He's 24 and his birthday is on November the 24th. We also think he's spent a fair bit of time working in Holland. Does this mean anything to you? If so, do you know where he is now? Next to this jeweler's shop in Bristol last October. This man enters the shop and asks to try on a Rolex watch. He sits down and chats with the assistant for some time. When her attention's diverted, he snatches the watch and runs out of the shop. If you know who he is, call us on 0500 600 600. Do you know who they are? Please call us here in the studio. Should people in prison be allowed access to a TV? It's been a, a fairly controversial point, but the detectives here hope a lot are watching tonight because in large part this is an appeal to people who are inside. 
as well as anyone who did a stretch between 1990 and 1997. My mum was 68 when she was murdered and she was in good health. She did everything for herself. She never asked you know, anybody for anything. She was fine. She was mum. Irene Graney was murdered in her flat in Bermondsey, South London, in May 1990. Thirteen years later, the case remains unsolved. It was to this ground floor council flat in Rotherhithe that police were called on Saturday evening. A neighbour living above Irene Graney in Eugenia Road alerted them after worries that she hadn't been seen. Officers had to break windows... To it was one of a series of eight very violent attacks against mainly older women in the London borough of Southwark. Maybe other attacks went unreported, but the known one started in 1988, went on for 18 months and culminated in Irene's murder. Victims said the rapist was then in his early 20s. He mostly went for ground floor flats and broke in after dark. Take your clothes off, then I'll go. Be quiet. I'm going to be violent, but I don't want to hurt you. When are you gone? Be quiet. I need a cup of tea. I'll make you a cup of tea. Please go. Please. 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 Be quiet. Former detective Brian Bowden Brown is from the Murder Review Group, bringing expertise to long standing unsolved crimes. It, it was originally dubbed the Southwark Rapist series. Um, I came across it because I started to review the murder of Irene Graney. I had no idea at the time that uh, a series of, of rapes uh, such as these were involved. It's, it's probably the worst series of crimes that I've, I've ever come across. Uh, I mean, the, the, the violence and the sexual assaults that these old ladies had to suffer is, is absolutely sickening. Brian consulted Metropolitan Police crime analysts who look for patterns in behaviour that link crimes. He asked us to have a look to see what we thought, whether we could confirm that we believed they were committed by the same offender, and also to see if we could come up with any new offences that may have been committed since. To do this, we searched on the language used before one of the offences, where the offender said that he was being chased by some men. I've just come from the pub and there are three black men chasing me. She found a strikingly similar phrase had been used in many of the attacks between 1988 and 1990. But even more remarkable, after a seven-year gap, it was used again in a quite separate violent burglary in 1997. We were absolutely convinced it was the same man. The offences had happened within the same small area of Southwark. The victims were elderly and they had a ground floor property. Oi, mate. Can you help me? Three people are chasing me. Let me in. Don't even know who you are. Get out. Minutes later, a next door, this time in the neighbour's bedroom. Don't turn the lights on. I've got a knife. Oh, what do you want? Don't mess with me. I've just finished the seventh stretch. What he did say was that he had just come out after serving a seventh stretch. Now, that could link in with the fact that we hadn't heard anything from him, he hadn't committed any offences since the, the murder of Irene Graney in May of 1990. So he could very well be our man and the fact that he hadn't done anything was that he was in prison. Oh, oh, don't hurt him! Don't we only hurt hint him. at the level of violence. The man was beaten with a metal towel rail and the woman was almost strangled. Give me the money! <laughs> On this occasion, though the victims were badly beaten, they weren't sexually assaulted. <laughs> what worries me is that whilst we haven't had any recent offences like this that we believe he's responsible for, he's still out there. He hasn't been brought to justice for this. And, and we don't know when or if he, he's going to strike again. When it first happened, I suppose in, in, I just wanted to get hold of him. 
wanted to know why. Why pick on somebody that age? And, you know, obviously I just, I'd like to have killed him. But as the years have gone on, I just feel that the man's really sick and he needs help. And somebody out there, he belongs to somebody, they must know. They've got to know. They've got to report him. Apart from Irene's murder, at least one of the other victims nearly died, and certainly there seemed to be something like attempted murder again and again. It's really the sort of crime that creates revulsion among everyone, which is why we want help tonight from everyone, including those who might recognise the offender from a stretch in prison. Uh, this is Brian Bowden-Brown, retired formerly from the police force, but now taking on this in, in, in quite a big way. He could, the offender, have been bluffing about being in prison. On the other hand, it does make sense, doesn't it? Yeah, that's correct. He could be, so we've got to take it really with some caution. But on the other hand, it would add up. No offences since 1990, 1997, he comes back. Now, if he'd been in for something like this, you would have found him, because you can go through the records, that would have been easy. So it's unlikely he has been convicted for a similar offence. I wouldn't have thought so. I think this man is a burglar. I think predominantly that's what he does, yeah. and I think that's what he did in this particular case. He burgled right, yeah. the victims' homes beforehand. He recognised yeah. that there was... Uh, an elderly uh, lady yeah. living there on her own, um, possibly disabled, Zimmer frame, walking stick, knew she was an easy target, went back later on and subjected them to these dreadful attacks. Now there is uh, some evidence that this is the same man who in 1989 was caught burgling the Great American Wine Company in Southwark in this area. Uh, there he was interrupted by a member of staff. Oh, I'm going to be mugged by two black guys, they're chasing me. Now, Brian, that's still an important part of your inquiry. Tell us why. Well, it is, because um, it, it links in with some of the other offences. What I'm very interested in is tracing the office manager, uh, a lady by the name of Patricia Peters. Now, I'd like to speak to her because I think that she can give me some very important information, not only about the white guy who she disturbed, but she also saw a black man standing outside, and she was convinced that he was the accomplice of the white man. Now, Patricia Peters, I should say, was born on the 1st of October 1936. So you know all that, but, but no one knows where she is. But and, of course, at the time, this wasn't linked, and she would have no idea that it was linked. No, not at all. Now, what about the accomplice? Because the truth is, he probably has no idea it's linked. He might be up appalled at what his mate was up to. Well, exactly, and I, I'm, I'm hoping that he is watching, because I really do desperately need to speak to him. And if he says, look, I'm very frightened of ringing up because you're now going to do me for this burglary or something like that. He's got nothing to worry about, Nick, in you're relation to burglary. For, for that type of crime for burglary 13 years ago, yes, I am. What I'm interested in is catching the guy who committed these absolutely horrendous crimes on these elderly ladies. They are so horrendous that the Metropolitan Police themselves have put up a £10,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the killer. If that was you, the accomplice, you've got that offer of immunity, you've got the offer of the reward, for heaven's sake, give us a call. And if there's any other way anyone else can help, call us here in the studio or call the incident room on 020 7321 7353. Who doesn't remember the song, Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend? And who sang it, of course, Marilyn Monroe. Well, a couple of weeks ago, two pieces of her jewellery were stolen from a special exhibition on her life in London. And this dress is also in the show, and she's believed to have worn it on her first date with Joe DiMaggio. But the two pieces of jewellery are still missing, so can you help us find them tonight? This is D.I. Tim Forber of the Metropolitan Police and David Gainsborough Roberts, who's a Marilyn Monroe collector. Tim, first of all, tell us about the jewellery that was stolen. Well, the first item is a gold ring that depicts a letter M, and that was encrusted with 25 diamonds. The second item was a gold bracelet that's set with clusters of clear stones. And David, how much would they be worth? I mean, the ring, for example. The ring would probably fetch between 100 or 200,000 pounds, mainly because, of course, it is belonging to Marilyn Monroe. I mean, uh, if, it, if, it, if it wasn't anything to do with oh, her? Oh, two, three thousand pounds, something like that. Really, as little yeah. as that? Yeah, oh, as little as that. And what about the bracelet, for example? Probably 50,000 pounds, but again, it's only sort of knockdown value is about 1,000 pounds, unless you can prove that it belonged to Marilyn Monroe. Now, there's a particular story attached to the ring, isn't there? Well, yes, because I gather that this was a special ring in that Joe DiMaggio 
um, her second uh, husband uh, gave to her. And Marilyn didn't have very much jewellery, and so this is the only piece of jewellery that I even that I know that Joe DiMaggio ever gave uh, gave to her. And why didn't she have a lot of jewellery? You know, star in the Hollywood system. Well, she never had any money. That was the simple reason. She died in debt um, for a film like Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. She earned a hundred thousand uh, dollars. Jane Russell earned a million. And as she said, I'm the blonde in the picture. I'm the star. But I'm afraid to say Marilyn was always badly cheated by everybody in Hollywood. Now. Tim, the people who, who stole this, do they know what they were looking for? Well, we think so. What we know is that they entered the exhibition without pink. They went straight to the exhibition room uh, where the jewels were on display and they were in and out of the exhibition in under three minutes. So from that, we presume that they did know what they were looking for. You've got CCTV of a man in the gallery. What can you tell us about him? Well, it, it shows a black male, a dark-skinned black male. He's aged in his early 30s. Um, he's about 5 foot 11 and he's got short black hair. Now, at the time of the incident, he was wearing a dark blue pinstripe suit. Um, he had a red shirt underneath with a light tie. Um, he was also carrying what we think was a three-quarter length dark overcoat. And we'd very much like to speak to this man in connection with our investigation. And of course, he may have been there perfectly innocently, but Indeed. nonetheless, you, you'd very much like to talk to him Indeed, tonight. Indeed, yes. In terms of who this jewellery is going to be sold to, I mean, who can the people who, who took the ring and the bracelet, who, who's going to buy it from them? I would think that they would find it very difficult because none of the auction houses or the big dealers are going to take it. What you've got to have with this is a letter of provenance or an affidavit, uh, some form of identity, and as soon as that you prove who it is, then, of course, those people are going to be onto the, onto the police. So what's likely to happen to them, do you think? I suppose they'll cannibalise it. They'll chop it up and flog it down the old Kent Road for what they can get for it, which is a great pity. There's a reward, isn't there, Tim? That's right, yeah. Private companies offered a reward of up to £5,000 for any information leading to the return of this jewellery. So I'd ask that anyone with any information regarding the current location of the jewellery, and in particular any dealer who's offered this jewellery for sale, please contact us. We need to speak to you. OK, well, it would be such a terrible shame for this jewellery just to, to be melted down or just disappear. If you know anything at all, please give us a call. Studio appeals like that can be very, very effective, but of course it's the reconstruction film reports on crime which the people usually remember. Sometimes, though, all it takes really is uh, a word or two in the studio. And in this case, the words from Crime Watch in May 2001 were about an unusual scam which we've now reconstructed for you. It's what every grandma wants to hear. Hi, Nan, I've won the National Lottery. But beware, somebody in East London has been calling people by the dozen, pretending to be a relative and telling them that he has won. He first started his investigation in October of 2000, when an elderly lady had been uh, conned out of £450. Hello? Hello, Nan. Sorry I haven't run for a long time. Oh, it's not you, is it, boy? It is. Listen, Nan, I've got some news. I don't know if I should tell you. Oh, I'm going to tell you. You're sitting down. Well, what is it? I've won the lottery. Two million quid. Is that you, Brian? Uh, yeah, of course it is. I'm up at the lottery office. Oh, I'm so full of champagne. <laughs> I mean, I know it don't sound like me. <laughs> <laughs> but it certainly is. Have you told your dad? No, 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 no. no I, w I wanted to be with you when I call him. I'm finished here. I'm just going down the cash point. I want to get some money. I want to get Dad something. Hello? The um, comments seem very plausible and very methodical about planning this, uh, this sort of crime. And from the start, it looked like he was getting away um, with uh, quite a bit of money. Hi, Nan. Brian again. Oh, hello, Brian, love. Listen, Nan, I've done something really stupid. I've left my cards at home. I can't believe it. I wanted to get Dad something. I'll see if I can get someone here to lend me some. Hello? I think the worst thing Hello? about uh, this particular crime is preying on elderly and vulnerable people, your mums and your grannies. And you can't get much lower than that. But he didn't worry. Hello? Hi, Nan. It's me again, Brian. Oh, hello, Brian, love. How are you getting on? I've got someone to lend me 150 quid, but I don't want to go all the way back to the lottery office. Can you borrow me any to pay him back? I'll send a cab for it. Oh, I don't know about that, Brian. I could let you have 80. It's all I've got left of me pension. It's not enough, Nan. I need a bit more than that. I could give you 20 from the rent. 
All right, it'll have to do. Stick it in an envelope. Address it to Mr Dean. It's the bloke at the lottery. OK, Brian. I'll send a cab now, and I'll see you later on then. All right, love. Bye. He was determined to get some cash, and some of these old ladies only had £50, and he still grabbed that. Yeah, I need a cab to pick up a package. These victims couldn't afford to lose this sort of money. You know, some of it's life saving, some of it's bills, and some of it's their pensions. And uh, the trauma that these people went through was uh, terrible, and I think he was an evil person. All right, mate, you've got a package of Dean? Yeah. We weren't getting very far with identifying the suspect. So we decided that uh, we need to warn the general public about what was happening, and that's why we went to Crime Watch. During the programme, we had a number of calls from uh, victims' uh, children, and it's then when I realised that um, the vastness of these crimes, because uh, only a few, were getting, probably a third, are being reported. At least 68 old people, and probably many, many more, have been tricked out of their savings. And as a result of that appeal, a man phoned in and gave me uh, Joseph Casser as the man that was uh, carrying out this sort of crime. Joe Casser is um, a drug addict and a, a small-time drug dealer and uh, quite a, a lonely sort of person. The person that phoned in uh, naming Casser, it was obvious that he was um, quite close to him. So we got a search warrant and uh, went down to Casser's address on the 16th of November. During the search, we found a page from the A to Z covering the Ilford and Dagenham area. And from that page, I identified nine crimes, nine victims. We found a SIM card. And from that SIM card, we later identified 31 victims, and only eight had been reported. Is this yours, Joe? Yeah, it's an old one. And then we found an envelope with uh, elderly persons writing on. Mr Dean. That's interesting, Joe. Initially, when I, I met Casser, he didn't show any emotion whatsoever. He, he was um, still coming down on drugs. Um, and all through every time that I've had any dealings with him, he showed no remorse whatsoever. But I never believed him. The jury never believed him. And he was sentenced to five years imprisonment. Well, that's just one example of how one call can make a difference. And, and while that was playing, actually, we had a call uh, just in here. Let me just... Uh, I've just seen it. Um, the ring... Uh, you remember in the, the jewellery that was stolen from Marilyn Monroe, that ring with the M? Um, someone has rung in saying they saw that in a jewellery window yesterday. So, obviously, we're going to chase that up. And on the Lincolnshire attack, you remember that was that burglar who didn't seem to care who heard him uh, and carried out that knife attack on the father and the daughter. We've had 11 names in just the first 10 minutes of the programme, so a lot of people very keen to help. Uh, Jackie's over at the intake desk. She's had some more calls. Jackie, what have you had? Yeah, and a really good response, I have to say, to the, that awful robbery in Lincolnshire. I've just been looking through and having a, a couple have caught my eye. One we've had from a, a gentleman in the West Midlands who was burgled not that long ago, and um, he's... His burglary, the way he's described it, it's actually is very similar to the way the man's got in, so I'm really quite excited about that. And one of my colleagues in Essex Police, a sergeant, has rang in suggesting somebody that he knows quite well. So that's really good news, so keep them coming in. The studio number is on the screen, and if you're watching on digital satellite TV, you can email us here directly through your remote control. Just press the red button on your handset and choose Crime Watch. Coming up, can you help find the murder of the man with a secret life? and paintings, among other things. Do you recognise any of these? Do you recognise this man? He has been attacking young women in Essex, but he's left behind so many clues that he is bound to be recognised tonight by someone. 10.15 on a Tuesday morning, and a teenager is on her way to work in Lexton, Colchester. She was so frightened by what happened next, she's asked us to use an actress's voice instead of her own. I was walking to work that day because I didn't get the bus. And her journey took her down Park Road.
guy. He asked me where the three schools were and I just turned around and said I didn't know because by that point he had his hand on his trousers and I thought, I ain't telling you nothing. Do you know where Alderman Blackshill School is? No. Or St Benedict's School? So I just made up an excuse and said I've got to go, so I did. And then he come and turned around and grabbed hold of me. Don't scream or I'll cut you. She noticed his boots were spattered with white paint. Then this bloke come past and he told me not to say anything to this bloke, to just be quiet. There was no reason for that passerby to believe anything was wrong, but he is an important witness. But then I pretended I was having an asthma attack. I need my pump! I need my pump! She really is asthmatic and was obviously convincing. Sometimes I think about it and I think, well, I might not be here today, I could be somewhere else, you know. I could be in heaven or whatever. I could be suffering worse than what the other girls have. And there have been other girls. At least five have been attacked since September. The first was 20 miles from Colchester in Chelmsford, where an office worker was on her way home from the gym. Her journey took her through the Central Park, then up a pathway by the railway line towards Waterhouse Lane. She caught a glimpse of a man walking behind her. As in the Colchester attack, he's around 30 years old, at least six foot tall, and had very short light brown or perhaps dark blonde hair. Don't look at my face and I won't hurt you. Don't scream. As in other attacks, he masturbated and he left behind DNA. What takes him between Chelmsford and Colchester? And in particular, why are so many of his attacks within a half mile radius of the Colchester suburb of Lexton? In some cases, he struck up a conversation, as with a victim on her way home from a night out. <laughs> I didn't mean to scare you. He asked her about her job, her family, her age, and did she have anyway. a boyfriend? <laughs> I'm a cashier. I'm sorry, I've got to get home. I'm working in the morning. You're right. His behaviour is always similar, though increasingly violent, and so often in the same locations. So he's probably local. He's mid 20s to mid 30s, tall and slim with short blonde hair. He was smoking embassy number one. He had paint spattered boots. Someone has to know him. Free call 0500 600 600. These are the uh, detectives investigating this. Uh, they've colleagues two at their incident room. That's on 01245 464 treble two. Detective Superintendent Gareth Wilson is in charge. You've got so much on this, Gareth. You've got so many clues. Build, height, location, what he smokes, what he looks like. It's still difficult for someone to show up a friend, to call in about a relative. Anything else at all that, that would point to somebody in particular? During uh, one of the um, attacks, the victim just described the attacker as having a, a very small one centimetre scar underneath the right eye. Um, but what I would say is we do have DNA. It's just so easy to eliminate somebody from the inquiry, so please do call us. Right, easy as that. Give us a call, please. Our number again, 0500 600 600. Now to some antiques which were recovered by Devon and Cornwall Constabulary last month. Some items from the hall, which came from a shop in Exeter, have already been reunited with their owners, but there are many more that haven't. And here are just a few. And to take us through them, I'm joined by antiques expert Paul Hayes. So, Paul, tell us about what we've got. Now, first of all, these three paintings, they're all done by the same person, weren't they? That's right, yeah. The first one we look at here is an oil on canvas of a bather. It dates probably about 1920, 1930. It's very art deco. It's beautiful, isn't it? Absolutely superb. Look at this short haircut here, this sort of angled dress. And also there's little remnants of a lily pond or something where she's just stepped out of at the back. Very well painted. It's quite a valuable picture. That one's actually by an artist called uh, Sidney Percy. Kendrick. So how much would, would that be worth? That would probably take you back about £3,000. £3,000, right. So all these painted by the same... So quite right. likely they may have come from the same home. Yeah, from I one think... one person who, who had all three. Yeah, somebody may be involved with the family or somebody who collected his particular work. I mean, he did exhibit, but he's not one of the best-known right. artists, so... It could be, could be somebody related, possibly. And now we've got this, this portrait here. Tell me about that. Uh, well, this is actually commissioned by this particular gentleman. This was pre-photography. And the idea was that the gentleman of the house would have his portrait done 
A lot of these are actually done in studios. And if you have a look, if I cover his face up, we can see the actual uh, dress that he's wearing, sorry, the dress, the, the clothes he's wearing yeah. is actually quite poorly painted. His face is where the main detail is. Now this is actually on canvas again, but it's been placed on a board and there is a location stamp of a frame maker manufacturer on that board, so that's what we're looking for with that particular well, Because of course with all these, anyone who rings, I mean if, if you ring and you think these belong to you, you're going to have to give, uh, you will be asked by the police about some identifying mark just to prove that they really do belong to you. Now, now there's one other thing here which um, is this, this uh, Japanese plate, I, I presume? Yes, it is, yeah. Absolutely superb quality. This is called Kutani. This is actually manufactured in the island of Honshu. Honshu, right. In a region right. called Kutani. We know that because it's the brick red colour which they use predominantly. And also, can you see this little symbol here? Uh -huh. That's the house of Kutani. It basically means the area where it's manufactured. But all these are very, very symbolic. I mean, we have a, a musical stone here which was used by a scholar around about 1850, 1860. And also, this tree in the middle is the peach tree and that was a good luck charm and also the food of the immortals. So it tells a story, this, and it's quite unique, I think. Right. Valuable, this? Uh, it's probably sort of three to five hundred pounds, right. but probably more sentimental value. Yeah, somebody. well, of course, well, that's true with all these things, isn't it? And there, again, there are identifying marks on the back of this, so anyone who, who wants to claim this as theirs will have to know about those. Yeah, it's quite unusual, the markings on the back of that now, one, actually. Now, let's take a quick look at these, because these items, I mean, they're not particularly valuable in themselves, but they may have huge sentimental value for whoever they belong to. Yeah, I mean, we should be able to recognise these. I mean, we've got this one here. This is a gentleman's watch fob. This is going on his, on his watch chain, basically. But it's got two oars here. I think it's been like a sporting uh, medal of some sort. And then the thistles near the top here, so probably a Scottish origin but what's unusual about that one it has actually been removed at the back with the original inscription has been taken off and this new plate placed on top now that could have been done legitimately by someone wanting to reuse it or as a way of disguising the actual original sort of purpose of it and this diamond ring it's got uh, let me just show it to you here it's got one of the diamonds is missing been taken out and then it's got an inscription inside hasn't that's it? right i mean this one's pretty unique i mean it actually has a, two sets of initials and a date which i would take to be a wedding date or probably the date they actually engaged so that would have enormous sentimental value yeah, to, to someone to either it belongs to them or to to, to a, a, a child or yeah. grandchild okay well let's see you know if you think any of these antiques could be yours call in the studio and let us know 0500 600 600 or you can call the instant room on 01404 548646 now as i was saying just now you'll be asked some questions about the item before police hand it back to you just so they know it really does belong to you um, now here again is detective sergeant jackie hames now, faces of four people that my colleagues across the UK are anxious to trace. Back in 1999, Stephen McKay was seen in a pub car park in Sudbury, Suffolk, when a serious disturbance took place. It ended in the murder of a young man. We've been trying to find Stephen McKay ever since. He used to be an HGV driver, and we know that he travels around the country a lot, so have you seen him? A year ago, Amjad Khan was charged with intent to supply £20,000 worth of heroin, but he failed to turn up at court. His last known address was in Nether Edge in Sheffield, but may, he may have connections in Birmingham. Amjad Khan used to be a shopkeeper, but we now believe he's unemployed. Now to Hull and Thomas Lowther, who's wanted by Humberside police in connection with an attack near a nightclub. The assault left a man unconscious for 10 days with a fractured skull. Thomas Lowther is from a travelling community and it's likely he's living on a site somewhere in Yorkshire or the West Midlands. And this is Malcolm Bailey who's been charged with deception. He led people to believe they were investing in offshore bank accounts and in a wildlife park. At 61, he's a bit of a loner who travels around the country, sometimes using the aliases Bryant or Keller. The last sighting we have of him is May last year when he was in Plymouth seen driving a Rolls Royce. Call us if you've seen him. There's something unusual about our next appeal. It comes from a private police force, one that has all the standards of a national force, but which is paid for by private companies. It's the Port of Dover Police, and they've asked us to help crack two substantial fraud rackets. Dover is Britain's busiest ferry port, handling 16 million passengers a year, two million cars, and about as many lorries, all supervised by 50 officers. On a daily basis, um, the public will see our officers wandering around the port. They are high profile. They are out there looking for offences all the time. They're out there amongst the public all day long. And then you can just exit and out. No problem at all. Thank you. All right, sir. Thank you. Bye-bye. We deal with a lot of retail crime on board the ferries, um, which might be shoplifting, it might be credit card fraud. People seem to have a mind change when they get on board a ferry. I mean, they see that link disappear with the land because they're in shops which are effectively floating supermarkets. 
um, stocked with desirable goods and people try and steal them. Um, but they've given no thought to the fact that they've nowhere to run because if they're caught on the outward journey towards France, then the shipping operators will bring them back. If they're caught on the inward journey to Dover, we're there waiting for them. And with so many vehicles moving on and off the ferries, there are traffic problems too. Not least that of foreign visitors driving on the wrong side of the road. Yeah, we get uh, foreign drivers who um, obviously go the wrong way round roundabouts, so uh, escort them off the roundabout as quickly as possible. When you go onto a UK roundabout, you always go over to the left-hand side. Yes, sir. OK, so you follow it that way. Try and remember that in future. Yes, sir. Have you anything to drink again. at all on the ferry? No, no, sir. I think I had an, uh, no, sir. You think you may have. Then what I want you to do is just seal your lips around the end here. Yeah. Okay, and I want you to blow. Big deep breath. Okay, blow. Keep blowing, keep blowing, keep blowing, keep blowing. It has detected that you have a small amount of alcohol in your body, okay, but you are okay to drive. Overweight vehicles are another problem. Not just lorries, but private vans and cars laden down with beer and wine. There have been fatal accidents in Kent because overloading has compromised steering and suspension. There's premeditated crime too, and here's tonight's appeal from the Port Police. Laura Kelly Austin is wanted for credit card fraud while working as a stewardess on one of the ferries operating out of Dover. She disappeared shortly after being arrested by the Port of Dover Police two and a half years ago. Although a last known address was in Dover, police believe she may be working on cruise ships in the Caribbean. So have you been on a cruise? Do you remember her? Alexander Peter Constandinou is also wanted for credit card fraud whilst making frequent journeys on ferries from Dover. He's been missing since September 2000 and Port Police are keen to arrest him. He's known to have family in the West Midlands and in Cyprus, although we have his passport. If you know where either of these two are, call us on 0500 600 600. As you know, we always like to bring you news of cases that we've featured on Crime Watch, especially uh, if they've been solved, and especially if they've been solved by Crime Watch. And indeed, many are resolved thanks to calls from viewers. But here are some that were detected by different means. A year ago, we made an appeal for anybody who might recognise these two. John and Thomas Connors, a father and son who failed to appear at court in Worksop. They're originally from Ireland, but could now be anywhere, and they could be using other names. Independently of the programme, Thomas Connors was caught and is now serving three and three-quarter years. But his father is still missing. Can you tell us where he is tonight? In November 2001, we appealed for witnesses following a vicious attack on a 24-year-old, Jonathan Gurney. It left him in a coma. Few leads came out of our appeal, but detectives then discovered a fingerprint on a car next to where the attack took place. It matched that of Joseph Barrett. He's since been convicted and is serving a sentence of five years. Last July, we showed you the CCTV still of Christopher Coulthard. He was wanted in connection with a string of church burglaries. Two months after the programme, a vicar saw him acting suspiciously outside his church in Aberystwyth and called the police. I had heard that there was a man who had been burgling churches in Pembrokeshire, so it was in the back of my mind. Christopher Coulthard was later arrested and convicted on a total of 15 charges of burglary. He asked for 502 other church thefts to be taken into account and offered advice to the police on church security. Christopher Coulthard is now serving a four-year sentence. It's sometimes surprising what you find out about people. This is the story of a well-liked man. Back in early December, he'd been out in Belfast city centre buying Christmas presents. It wasn't until next morning that anybody realised something terrible had happened. Hello? 
You all right there? On Tuesday the 3rd of December, Arthur Warrington Macaulay, known to many of his friends as Warren, was found in Coles Alley in central Belfast shortly before 8 in the morning. Warren had suffered a fatal head injury and died two days later in hospital. He never regained consciousness. Well, I first became acquainted with Warren nearly 30 years ago uh, when both of us came to train here in Mugamore Abbey as uh, nurses. In more recent years, we worked together in the children's unit, children who had challenges in their lives. And he was known as a, a great confidant. People would have gone to him with their, their difficulties. And they always knew that they would get a, a kind response and good advice from Warren. That was a measure of the man, so it was. Warren had a day off on Monday the 2nd of December and was seen by a neighbour leaving his house in Antrim, where he lived alone, shortly before 11 that morning. Some of his actions over the rest of the day are what you'd expect of a man devoted to his family and friends. Others have come as a surprise, even to those closest to him. By early afternoon, Warren was in central Belfast, where it was the first day of late-night Christmas shopping. He was wearing black shoes, dark trousers and a blue fleece top. Just before half past two, Warren bought a gift from the body shop on Donegal Place. Warren was a very kind, very generous person. Uh, always remembered uh, people's birthdays, remembered important occasions, and celebrated those by buying uh, very appropriate presents. But many of those who received Warren's gifts didn't know there was another side to his life. During the rest of the afternoon, he made several visits to locations popular with some gay men. Warren used an alias at these times, Aaron. Uh, this was a side of his life that was unknown to us, but something that he obviously wanted to keep very much to himself. One of the places Warren visited that afternoon was the public toilets on Arthur Lane. Shortly after half past three, he left with an acquaintance whom police have eliminated from their inquiries. They walked around Donegal Square together before heading up Callender Street towards the Woolworths on Anne Street, where they parted shortly after four o'clock. Half an hour later, it had turned dark. CCTV cameras recorded Warren visiting the public toilets on Coles Alley, yards from where he was found the following morning. From then on, the trail runs cold. What we do know is that Warren had made plans to meet someone called Stevie or Paul at the Custom House Bar on Skipper Street at 8 o'clock, but he wasn't seen there. But at 10 past 9, a woman walking along Church Lane was startled by someone she assumed was drunk. It was Warren, and he lay in Cole's Alley until he was found the following morning. About 20 minutes later, a shop assistant was heading home along Anne Street after finishing her shift. She saw two young men walking ahead of her, who recognised a couple emerging from the far end of Coles Alley from where Warren was lying. <laughs> Were you any of these people, coming out from Coles Alley, walking down Anne Street, or in the group at the bandstand on Arthur Square? If so, police are desperate to hear from you. You may have vital clues that could help find Warren's attacker. I think in a word, uh, Warren is irreplaceable. Um, he was uh, such a talent and had such skill, such devotion and such loyalty to the children, to the family, to the families of those children and to his colleagues, that that will be a void that will be extremely difficult to, um, to fill in. Well, with me is Detective Superintendent Alan Maines of the Police Service of Northern Ireland and Ryan O'Neill of the Rainbow Project, which represents the gay community. Alan, do we know if Warren's homosexuality had anything to do with this murder? Well, what, what I do know is that, first of all, the, the motive did not appear to be robbery. Um, and secondly, with the people that, that I have sort of uh, talked to, and that of the inquiry team, would suggest that Warren was quite cautious. Uh, and to the point where we know that he wouldn't have gone down the entry himself unless he was comfortable with the fact that he was down there with somebody. So I'm certainly keeping that very much open, but my inquiries are going down the road of, of, the, of that motive. And then there's this window, isn't there, where, where uh, we have no idea where he was between 5.30 and, what was it, 10 past 9? 
Yeah, it was ten, pa ten past nine. It's a complete blank then. Complete blank. The, the trail goes cold for us. All day we, we've actually got Warren on camera. We know his movements. 5.30 on the second, uh, it just... It just okay. goes cold. Now, now Ryan, you're, you're here to take calls from, from anyone, perhaps from the gay community, who, who doesn't feel particularly comfortable talking to the police. And if they want to remain anonymous, they can, can't they? Can indeed, yes. Uh, we have a guarantee from the police service that any information uh, received will be treated in the strictest confidence. Um, myself and my colleagues are certainly very pleased with the way the investigation has been handled and that the police service are very aware of the situation that a gay man could find himself in when uh, wanting to report uh, such incidents. Well, in terms of the situation that a gay man could find themselves in, I mean, Warren used an alias, didn't he, Aaron? Yes. Now, how common is it that someone would do that? It can be quite common uh, for people to use a false name uh, if you like to protect the, their private life. I mean, it's not that in any sense there's anything shady or untoward about either doing that or about Warren, is there? Certainly not. Um, it's just you, he wanted to, to protect his private life uh, from other individuals. OK, now, you've got new information tonight, haven't you, about, about this character called Stevie or, or Paul? We're not quite sure. Yeah, Stevie or Paul, we, we go back to the 14th of November last year. The information that we would have now would suggest that, that Warren knew this chap uh, and indeed uh, McKee's Dam near Hillsborough would have met him sometime just before the 14th of November. Warren himself described to the witness uh, as a chap being six foot uh, tall, uh, sandy coloured hair, in his mid-thirties and good looking. Now we also know the additional information that we've now got that this chap lives somewhere in Belfast uh, near BBC or the uh, just off former road in a fancy apartment and w we really are focusing our inquiries to this chap. OK, well, uh, call us here in the studio or you can call the Rainbow Project, that's 02890 319 030 or call the Instant Room on 02890, again, 700 534. Getting some really, really good calls tonight, and one on the Irene Graney murder. If you remember, she was one of eight elderly women who were viciously attacked back in 1988, 89. There was another one in 97. We were trying to find somebody who was a witness to a burglar, which really, really tied in, uh, called Pat Peters. Well, her sister's rung in, and the reason the police couldn't find her all this time is she's in the United States. We've now got her phone number. That looks very good indeed. And we've got so many calls on so many other things, including one man who's been named by three separate viewers, which is looking pretty promising. And on the uh, Essex sex attackers, we've got a lot on that as well, a lot of names. Some of them uh, are being investigated right now. All our numbers are on CFAX on page 621. And don't forget, you can uh, get a reminder of some of tonight's cases, plus crime prevention advice and a whole deal more on our website, bbc.co.uk forward slash crime. And if you've been a victim of crime and want to talk to somebody, victim support line is on 0845 30 30 900. Our phone lines are open until midnight tonight and again this Thursday and Friday from 7.30 in the morning until midnight. We'll be back after news, as always, with the Crime Watch update. And if that's after your bedtime, don't have nightmares. Sleep well. Good night. Good night.